Please welcome, please join me in welcoming Professor Hunt. Thank you very much. Um, it was a wonderful introduction, uh, and I really appreciate all the kind words. Uh, and it's an introduction that comes after already an incredible day of, of scholarship and engagement dialogue. So I want to thank Professor Sharma, Professor Kilpatrick, Professor Siri for the chance to be part of this, uh, to do this lecture, and then also be part of this larger symposium on these critical themes. Uh, and I also want to thank the Steinman family for sponsoring this. Um, and uh, I understand Seymour Steinman really set a, a, a powerful example with his interest in engaging with the academic work and how, thinking about how it also translates into the world outside, which is what I hope to do a little bit tonight. And lastly, um, I feel very fortunate because um, I'm not the only act here tonight. We also have the chance to have um, a response from Professor Eric Kaplan, and I thank him for taking the time to, to read my remarks and to share his perspective on all of this. So my topic is a timely one, right? Uh, and it's a, it's a very difficult one. Uh, many of us here tonight have lost people in the war that's happening now between Israel and Gaza. Many people have experienced fear and danger in their own, in own communities. This is a campus that is experiencing a lot of turmoil and conflict, right, about it. So in a moment like this, we need uh, visions of hope and justice. And we also need history. Uh, I am hoping I'll give you some hope tonight, but I will definitely give you some history. Uh, and what I want to do is talk about the history of the Jewish human rights tradition. And I'll say more about what that means and why that connects to the themes of this larger symposium. But I'm going to start on a more personal note, as other speakers who've been uh, here before me at this podium today have already done. So uh, I often speak about this topic not in a beautiful spiritual space inside a university, but at synagogues, right? Uh, and I often speak there about human rights. And when I do, there's always a moment that happens at the end where the rabbi uh, jumps up from the seat to thank me afterwards and immediately goes into the congregational announcements, right? So usually what happens, it goes like this. That was a wonderful talk, Professor Leffler. Now, please remember to sign up for the bagel brunch next week. <laughs> or Professor Leffler, amazing, thank you so much. I need to let you know that so-and-so just had a baby, mazel tov, right? Um, so on one occasion, however, a few years back, something different happened. The rabbi jumped up, big smiles, and then turned to me and said, thank you, you just saved me the trouble of writing my sermon for this week. <laughs> so I didn't know where the rabbi was gonna go with this, right? I had spoken about human rights and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and these issues, so it could have gone in a lot of directions. But then he simply blurted out a verse from the book of Deuteronomy in the Torah. Justice, justice, you shall pursue that you may live and occupy the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And then he turned to me and said, isn't that the Jewish essence of human rights? Kind of a triumphant statement. Now, uh, and I hope people can see this uh, closely. I brought it here in Hebrew, uh, French, and English. Um, actually, two Englishes. Justice, justice, you shall pursue is a familiar slogan across the Anglophone Jewish world. We find it emblazoned on protest posters and website banners. It adorned the wall in the chambers of the late U.S. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was a hero to many for her work on civil rights and women's equality. Ruth Bader Ginsburg's words suggest here uh, that it, there's something of a primal Jewish commitment to universal ethics and legal justice, and she cited this verse. Yet the full verse which the rabbi recited doesn't simply urge whoops, uh, generic justice. Right? The second part refers to something quite specific. Justice will be rewarded with a national homeland. In fact, the verses that encircle this one describe the conquest of that land, the displacement of rival peoples and idolatrous faiths, the appointment of judges, and the triumph of Israel's sovereignty. Justice is not simply a pre-political moral charge or a universal ethic. It's a divine directive to a people seeking collective identity and political freedom in a world of warring ancient nations. So the question then becomes, which reading is the correct one? Ruth Bader Ginsburg with her universalistic one or the rabbis, which seems to be linked much more to particularistic commitments of Jews and also to contemporary political associations. 
And behind that is the larger question, how should we understand the entire relationship between Judaism and human rights? These questions are not merely academic. As you all know, as I already alluded to, we live in a moment of profound challenge for human rights and for Jews engaged with this question, it's a very, very difficult one as it is for Palestinians, for Muslims, for lots of different people who may not even actually have a side in the conflict but therefore are no less impacted in different ways. We're also in a moment of crisis uh, and this crisis often comes back to the question of how human rights can play a constructive role in the context of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Now, crisis is something that uh, is actually not new to Jewish history, and it's not new to the story. And what I want to do here in the lecture tonight is talk about the origins of that crisis and the origins of one response to that crisis, which I think will help us to think more broadly about some key questions of religion and human rights, religion and justice, how they can come together in positive visions, and how we need to think about them also as emerging from very concrete challenges. This coming April will mark the 50th anniversary of the McGill International Colloquium on Judaism and Human Rights. So when I received this invitation to speak here, I was excited by this um, you know, uh, synergy and by this anniversary and by this connection. Uh, and it also provided me a, a way to think about uh, what has been accomplished since that time and what does it mean to talk about crisis, religion, and human rights. 50 years ago, this coming April, 100 Jewish lawyers, jurists, scholars, rabbis, and others gathered in what was perceived to be a moment of crisis in the Middle East to issue the first international declaration on Judaism and human rights. That document came in the context of a recent war, what was known as the Yom Kippur War, uh, a war between Israel and Arab states. It came, as you'll hear me describe, in the context of ongoing uh, conflicts between Israelis and Palestinians, the Israeli occupation after 67, a lot of different things were in the air, uh, international terrorism, and debates at the United Nations, too, about human rights and religion. And the document that was produced in this moment of crisis was intended to address this issue by summoning up the Jewish human rights tradition. But what I want to argue is that in that moment, Jewish leaders who gathered here at McGill didn't so much as renew that tradition and summon it as invent it. And that whole idea of a religious human rights is something that emerges from this moment of political crisis. So what I'm going to do tonight is retrace that story and sketch out some of its longer term legacies. And I want to, in the course of this, try and show you how Jews came to think about human rights as a specifically Jewish religious tradition and commitment. And then I want to also show you how that is reflected in different ways in which subsequent generations of Jews interpreted that opening verse from Deuteronomy. And I do that because I think uh, I come to you as an historian. I mostly speak in a historical idiom about context and background and uh, traditions as opposed to spiritual commitments and ethics. But I want to weave in some perspectives about how to think about scripture because I think this is a really profound moment of anguish and that can be useful to many people. So I'm gonna do this, give you those readings, and then I'm gonna provide one last reading, my own, of that verse, which is also my answer to that rabbi's question. The idea for a world conference on Jews, uh, Judaism and human rights was the brainchild of this man, who was considered to be the living embodiment of international human rights, René Cassin. Cassin was a French Jewish lawyer who had risen to prominence after World War I, leading an international veterans peace group of French veterans trying to unite with veterans of other militaries in Europe to push for peace, to push for prevention of war, and to push for also the rights of veterans. He went on to play a prominent role in the wartime government in exile of France um, once the Nazis invaded. And then he went thereafter into the world of French diplomacy and French public affairs, uh, serving uh, on the Commission on Human Rights at the United Nations at his moment of creation after World War II, uh, and helping to draft the UN Universal Declaration on Human Rights. He was one of a number of people we can also mention, as was mentioned earlier today, John Peters Humphrey, a McGill law professor who was the first director of that UN Commission on Human Rights uh, and who played a really critical role in a lot of the drafting. 
I will say, because I'm a historian, he probably did more than Cassin, but Cassin was a very powerful and important figure who promoted this ideal of universal human rights. And for that, he was awarded the 1968 Nobel Peace Prize. Cassin also had a long history of involvement in Jewish communal life and Jewish politics, and he was president of an organization called the Alliance Universelle, excuse me, Alliance Israelite Universelle, which was an organization founded way back in the 19th century, uh, but as it proceeded into the 20th, was committed to international human rights, as well as uh, shifted into a strong commitment to uh, an identification with the state of Israel. In 68, Kassan took some of his prize money from the Nobel Prize and launched this institute, the International Institute of Human Rights. The plan was to promote education and to help spread the ideals of human rights. The Institute is still around in Strasbourg and it was put there because it was also part of a notion of European unity. In 1974, Cassin with that group joined with the Canadian Jewish Congress, the American Jewish Committee and some other international Jewish NGOs, some groups, to plan this conference for three days here at McGill, here in Montreal. And the stated goal of it was to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. When Cassin gave up to give his keynote lecture, he explained that we've begun here because we want to study this document, celebrate it, and we also want to initiate a series of international colloquia on the religious foundations of modern human rights. Why Judaism first, he said, because Judaism is the first religion to recognize individual human dignity, and because there are no doctrinal differences between Jews as there are between members of other religions. I think that's a very, um, you know, uh, easily falsifiable statement. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and yet he said, we don't have the problems that other religions have, if only that were the case. Um, the idea of dignity and this idea that Jews had invented or contributed dignity was so obvious and fundamental, Casson explained, that he basically went on to say, I don't need to say anything more about it. And after establishing that it is present in the Hebrew Bible, in the book of Genesis, in which we read that man is created in the image of God, Casson said, I'm now going to skip 3,000 years and move to the French Revolution. Uh, and he did this, of course, because Casson was French, uh, and because he said, les droits de l'homme, right, the rights of man. This was a, a seismic moment in the development of international human rights, and that's really actually what he cared uh, to focus on. Now, his speech, he said, was intended to voice confidence in what human rights were in the world and confidence in international human rights law. But his words also betrayed his doubts. We need religion in our work, he said in this address, because law may not be up to the task. Human rights violations can be better resisted avec plus d'autorité par les religions que par les juristes, right? You can better resist the violation of human rights with the authority of religions rather than jurists, lawyers. This was a pretty stunning admission for one of the world's most famous international lawyers and international human rights lawyers. And it suggested that in a time of crisis, human rights needed a new foundation not just to bolster it, but to repair it and replace it with something else. What precisely was the crisis? Cassin himself alluded obliquely to political challenges, uncooperative states, and ongoing anti-Jewish, quote, atrocities. Other speakers at this conference spoke more bluntly. One after another, they talked about the terrible politicization of human rights, and they focused in particular at the United Nations where they described how various countries had weaponized human rights to target their political opponents and to blunt investigations of their own conduct. They went on to say that the drafting and ratification of many key human rights treaties had stalled because of geopolitics and because of the Cold War. And it's notable, especially for those of us gathered here and thinking about what could come next, uh, they included the fact that a planned treaty on uh, an international convention against religious intolerance that had been started in the 60s, partly because of the role of different groups, including a number of Jewish groups, had stalled. And in fact, at the end of 1973, the UN had essentially voted to table it. Uh, it's, it's never gone forward. Uh, there's a declaration about uh, religious intolerance, but there's no international law about it. 
Furthermore, many of the speakers said debates have broken out about the hierarchy of rights. Many countries are now saying economic and social rights are crucial and maybe they're more important than free speech. And many of these people felt like this is uh, a profound misalignment of uh, human rights or a profound division of them and they were concerned about that. Above all, beginning in the 1960s, many post-colonial states from Africa and the Arab world and Asia had insisted that the most important human right was actually national self-determination. That was the one from which all other rights derived. Universal justice began not with individual freedom and dignity and equality, but with nation and land. Now, uh, one could spend a lot of time talking about this, but one can also simply say there's a lot of truth to this. After all, Cassin, when he spoke about les droits de l'homme, it's les droits de l'homme et, et du citoyen, right? This idea of human rights was a universal ideal that began to appear in the Enlightenment, but it was also an ideal which was then concretized through citizenship. You became a citizen of a country. And the Universal Declaration of Human Rights proclaimed universal rights, but the mechanism for receiving those rights was through states, and the responsibilities was for the states to provide them. So this was a, a kind of conceptual idea, and Hannah Arendt, of course, famously pointed this out too when she talked about rightlessness, that it meant very little to talk about the rights of men for Jews during the Holocaust if they didn't have a government that would recognize those rights and protect those rights, or they didn't have a place to turn if that, above the government's head. This was a raging debate in the 1960s and 1970s, and it became even more of an acute debate and a debate ensconced in crisis when you had situations such as that of two peoples claiming the same land for their nation states. This was the Israeli-Palestinian predicament. I'm not going to rehearse all the history, but I'll just say for context, war in 1948 had produced an Israeli state, but no Palestinian state. Egypt and Jordan took the territory of Gaza, West Bank, and East Jerusalem. War in 1967 had changed the boundaries, led to conquering, Israel conquering those territories. War in 73 had further changed the borders. And all the while, violence continued, and debates erupted about what was a just resolution of it. This was the context in which this conference took place in McGill. But there was one other additional context to it, and that is that 10 days before the delegates assembled, there was a terrorist attack in Israel. Three members of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine entered Israel from Lebanon and murdered 18 Israeli civilians, eight of them children. The Israeli army responded by entering Lebanon with a raid of its own, killing two civilians, one a child. So this is a, um, a slide up here just of the various things. This is the UN force that was up there uh, to prevent conflict across the borders um, in the north of Israel. Uh, this is a report from the UN Commission to investigate human rights in the occupied territories after the 67 war. And this is just a shot of the Security Council at the UN. At the Security Council, uh, when these issues came up, the, the Israeli ambassador called the terror attack a gross violation of Jewish human rights. And Arab diplomats countered that the root cause was Israel's violation of Palestinian human rights. The Saudi representative blasted Zionism as a perversion of both human rights and Judaism. And the Soviet ambassador suggested the Jews replace the Ten Commandments with a new engraved tablet bearing the words, get out of the occupied Arab territories. So it's a predictable conflict. Uh, and the Israeli ambassador walked out. Here's a picture of uh, the Israeli ambassador walking out to protest a resolution that condemned the Israeli reprisal raid, but not the Palestinian terror attack. These are familiar scenes, right? If you didn't know any of this history, these are, these are our scenes today, too, about how we should address this and what international organizations can do and uh, how different sides understand it. Now, this incident suggested how Judaism itself had become enmeshed in the global politics of human rights. When Jewish groups tried to raise the question of anti-Semitism in this context, the Soviet Union mounted a campaign to expel these NGOs from the UN on grounds that they were simply arms of Israel. How could they be seen as something else if they were identified with the Israeli state? Montreal was supposed to provide an answer to this crisis. That answer, Cassin concluded, was simple. We need to leave aside the politics and get back to first principles. We need to get back to religion. There was only one problem. And the problem was that the experts who came, like many academic experts, were nitpicking 
but they weren't just nitpicky, they basically disagreed with Cassin. Lou Henkin, who was an Orthodox Jew and a Columbia University law professor and had served in, in the American government promoting international human rights, he was basically the professor who convinced American legal scholars and policymakers that the U.S. should be more engaged with international human rights, it should accede to treaties, it should prioritize this in its legal diplomacy. Uh, and he built it out inside um, American law, this whole idea of human rights. And yet, when he was asked to talk about Judaism and human rights, he basically said, there's not much to talk about. Human rights as we know them today do not exist as concepts in the Bible or even in rabbinic Judaism. Judaism knows not rights but duties, and at bottom all duties are to God. The modern human rights principles of popular sovereignty and individual freedom and autonomy have no counterpoint in, counterpoint in ancient Judaism. Henkin went on to talk about the importance of justice and the importance of human rights. I just want to make it clear. He believed in human rights, and he was deeply committed to Jewish spiritual practice. But he said, we're not going to be able to go back and just pull it out like Hassan would like, because it's not there, right? Why? Because human rights, the way we think about them, they're a modern idea. We might talk about dignity and justice inside all kinds of religious traditions, and that's there. But that's different than saying there should be an international law and there should be principles by which you possess this inalienable right. Uh, the Bible doesn't talk that way. It talks about many visions of justice, but it doesn't talk that way. And the rabbis too, Henkin goes on to say, they don't talk that way, right? They have a language of law. They're deeply concerned about ethics, interpersonal relations, and many things correspond but that's not the same as saying they're talking about it. And of course, he pointed out there's no word for right in ancient Hebrew that really can translate. And there's no real sense of natural law the way there is in other religious traditions which develop important theological roots for modern human rights. Now, none of the experts denied, along with Kanka, none of them denied there was a strong Jewish connection to human rights. Many of them had spent decades, like Henkin, like Cassin, laboring on behalf of international human rights. Many of them could point to the role of Jews in international movements for peace and justice. Many of them could say proudly that they had actually helped draft some of these documents. But they did so without explicitly seeing this as a theological work. And it was born, as I've talked about in some of my other writing, more out of a minority experience and actually out of a political commitment rather than a fidelity to rabbinic law or to scriptural dogma. Still, the moment was a moment of crisis, and it demanded something. Speaker after speaker decried the state of human rights and said there must be something we can do, and the fact that things are becoming more and more politicized involving Israel-Palestine means we have to do something to clear this up. We have to be able to respond. And they didn't all agree, mind you, as Jews don't, about what was the just solution uh, of the political conflict in the Middle East, but they all felt we need to be able to produce something. And so they did produce something. Uh, and they produced the Declaration on Judaism and Human Rights. When we read this declaration in the light of the context I've just provided, I think two things stand out. First, there's this invention, and I don't mean that in a disparaging sense, uh, but the kind of creation of a religious genealogy for human rights. As they say, human rights are an integral part of the faith and tradition of Judaism the beliefs that man was created in the divine image, that the human family is one, and that every person is obliged to deal justly with every other person are basic sources of the Jewish commitment to human rights. Now, actually, even in, even in that last passage, you can see something interesting because uh, there's, there's a kind of slipperiness to this, right? Um, in the sense that human rights are part of Judaism, but actually Jewish principles make Jews committed to human rights. They're not the same, they're not identical. But this is a capsule origin story that focuses on dignity, unified humanity, and interpersonal ethics as Judaic meta-principles, if you will. It's also a statement that ignores Jewish law. It doesn't refer to halakha, the Jewish rabbinic legal system, which had governed ethics and belief and practice. It's the core structure of Judaism up until uh, the modern period. And it also doesn't mention God. So I haven't brought the whole declaration for the sake of time, although you can go and, and see it, and some of uh, the proceedings of the conference are here at McGill. Um, but there's no basis of morality in God. 
which you might think is an odd thing for a religious declaration about Judaism and human rights. The other glaring omission is Israel and Zionism. The text speaks in detail about anti-Semitism in the Soviet Union and Arab world, yet it doesn't mention the core feature of this rhetoric, which was anti-Jewish invective, often couched as simply anti-Zionism. Right? And the omission, I'm not interested so much in adjudicating that as pointing out that this is an omission. And the omission suggests that they saw the way to solve the crisis of human rights for the Jewish community was to simply avoid talking about Israel or politics in any way, shape, or form. Just focus on religion. And the result is overall a curious text because religion is referenced, but there's no divine basis or foundation for the human rights. Political anti-Semitism is alluded to directly. Everyone who read it could see what was being mentioned, but there's no overt acknowledgement of the political question from which this whole enterprise derives. Uh, and I think there's something, it's worth just pausing and thinking about that, right? If the problem is coming because of a crisis involving Israel, what does it mean to therefore issue a statement and say we're not gonna mention that? Perhaps because of these two features, the Montreal Declaration actually vanished pretty quickly from the public stage. There was an important book that came out a few years later that gathered some of the papers. Uh, and there was a number of other uh, scholarly writings that emerged from it. But the text itself was rarely, if ever, cited in the decades after its promulgation. And in fact, I went looking to really try and double check that. And the truth is, almost all the references to this text today come in scholarly writings about global religion and human rights, where someone collects all the statements of Islam and Judaism and brings it there. Again, that's not to knock it, it's just to point out that it didn't have a deep resonance inside Jewish communities. It didn't trigger tens of thousands of sermons. Uh, it didn't trigger a lot of reprints of it. Yet while Montreal did not necessarily reset the global discourse on Judaism and human rights, and this declaration didn't, it did, however, birth this tradition and this idea that religious human rights is a critical way for Jews around the world to frame their activism and their ethical commitments. From then on, virtually every Jewish hu discourse on human rights would cite a biblical verse to lend Jewish activism an ancient apolitical pedigree. Beginning in the 1980s, Israeli groups such as B'Tselem in the image and Rabbis for Human Rights sourced their names and their roots in liturgical imagery. Orthodox rabbis followed suit by hunting within Jewish law for a more comprehensive and specific human rights ethic. And here I point out, so these are just some different images. Uh, those are two prominent Israeli human rights groups. Uh, and these are images from publications that have come out um, from different scholars about Judaism and human rights. Um, as I'll say something more about in a second, those, that scholarship really ranges, and a lot of it probes very deeply into Jewish theology and tries to go much past where Kassan left off, right? To look at, well, what are the correspondences between ancient ethical principles and modern human rights? And what more can we say? Uh, and uh, there's a very interesting body of work that has begun, but also it remains a body of work as opposed to uh, a, a broad discourse. In terms of broad discourses, I'm gonna turn now to that uh, and the final part of my presentation. This religionization of human rights has provided contemporary Jews with a compelling symbolic language of spiritual justice. I'm not trying to debunk it or knock it. Yet it continues to reflect the unresolved political crisis that defined its origins. And by that I mean the questions and dilemmas of the ongoing Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So to make that more concrete, what I'm gonna do is return to that opening verse and talk about the different ways in which it echoes through and is read through different parts, including things across the political spectrum of Jewish life today. Here again is the line, Tzedek, Tzedek, Tirdof, Leman, Right? Justice, justice shall you pursue, that you may live and occupy the land that your God, Adonai, is giving you. When the rabbi, uh, back at that synagogue talk, quoted the line to me, a number of different things ran through my head. And the first of them was RBG, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. It sounded so different when she said it to the when he said it, right? <laughs> Recall that she kept the first five words of that verse mounted on her wall at the U.S. Supreme Court. It became her official credo. In 2019, she was awarded a Jewish Human Rights Award 
and presented with a gift of judicial robe collar. She wore these collars. I, there's a technical term for it. I've forgotten what it is. Um, but it is inscribed, it is not inscribed, it is threaded through are the Hebrew words justice, justice. Uh, and for Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she became an icon in part because she seemed to be the perfect example of a person who'd been a heroic activist, achieved a position of prominence and well-loved, and maintained this kind of powerful catchphrase at the heart of what she did. In her acceptance speech, she described an ancient and eternal Jewish commitment to universal justice that was woven into the fabric of Jewish experience and belief. Ignoring the rest of the biblical verse, she followed the Montreal precedent, right, in suggesting that Jewish human rights didn't need to involve politics. It's elemental justice, just the first words, right? But it turns out the rest of the verse didn't actually disappear from her imagination of human rights. Because in that speech, and then another one she gave in Israel upon receiving another award, she traced her ethical inspiration and her sense of human rights to her politics, in fact, to her Zionism. She said that she was a proud, lifelong member of Hadassah. Hadassah is a Jewish women's organization founded by Hadassah Sold, who was an early leader in the Zionist movement, as well as a feminist, who moved from the United States to interwar Palestine, worked on social justice, but worked on promoting this nationalist movement. Uh, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg also went on to mention Emma Lazarus, who's the poet who wrote the words on the base of the Statue of Liberty, give me your tired, your poor, huddled masses. Uh, and in her speech, Ginsburg actually said what was powerful about her was that she was a Zionist even before there was a movement. So politics mattered, and politics inspired her because these were strong women who had a vision of social justice and had a very strong Jewish identity, and that identity was expressed through this political commitment. So it was a Jewish campaign for a homeland, in other words, that inspired some of her ideal of human rights. What do we do with that? I'm not, again, bringing it to discredit her, but I'm bringing it to suggest the ways in which the universal and the particular, the religious and the political, are interwoven into the liberal Jewish imagination of human rights, right? The things that were left off stage or off text in Montreal were therefore not disappeared, but they were carried forward, and they carry through the words of RBG, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and many people in the Jewish world who struggle with the idea of an identification with Israel as a non-political elemental identification, as a source of justice, but also face deep conflict within themselves and their communities over the relationship between politics, religion, and human rights. The second thought that occurred to me when the rabbi was talking was that I wonder what this rabbi would say. And this is an Israeli rabbi named Arik Asherman. For decades, this left-wing religious activist has cited Jewish liturgy as the foundation of his commitment to defending Palestinian human rights. He was one of the leaders of Rabbis for Human Rights, and he has a newer organization called Torah Tzedek, the Torah of Justice. In uh, one of a number of essays, this one from 2019, he suggests that the biblical verse in question offers a moral challenge to Jews who hold sovereign, sovereign power over Palestinians. There can be no Jewish human rights without directly confronting the Jewish role in the conflict. And he goes on to quote the Hebrew writer Yishar Smilansky on justice, justice, saying, here on this land, the test of the Jews is the morality of self-restraint, not to inherit what is not one's own, not to ignore the tears of the oppressed. So I'll go back here and just say, in other words, he's reading this verse as a kind of moral challenge, right? It is ingrained in the Jewish spirit, This commitment to human rights, the religion is a foundation for it, but it can't be separated from taking a stance on this moral dilemma. It can't only be about activism on behalf of another community, it has to be also addressing this political conflict. I will note here one other thing, which is that in the title of the essay from which I quoted, Asherman frames it as a question, does Judaism teach universal human rights? And he describes the process, just like Cassin and Henkin and those other people, of searching in the tradition. So even at this late date, for people who is axiomatic as a rabbi, as an ethical person, as a progressive activist, he still basically says, well, it's not necessarily given. I have to go looking for it inside the tradition. Now, I want to bring one other uh, response and vision, which is, I think, probably what the rabbi who uh, reacted to me had in mind. And it probably wasn't 
a religious human rights ethic in which nationalism, liberalism are uh, related and in tension, or this one in which they're just kind of harmonious. Uh, it's a very different vision, also a religious vision of human rights, uh, but a different one that takes a different meaning uh, out of this verse. And this is the emerging area of what could simply be called conservative, politically conservative Jewish human rights. In 2013, an Israeli politician, uh, we would say, for those of you who, who follow Israeli politics, centrist, center-right, Namioaz Hendel launched a group called Blue and White Human Rights. And their goal was to articulate an authentically Jewish and Zionist human rights ethic. They explained, we don't want this only to be the product and the project of the left. We also believe in human rights. We take these principles seriously, even if we don't agree about this conflict. They went on to say Israel should support Palestinian rights and dignity, but also they should annex all of the territory of the West Bank because it's the biblical Jewish homeland. In its insistence that Jewish human rights begin with the possession of the land, this argument echoes our verse. From political ownership, from sovereignty, they argue, comes ethical responsibility towards a conquered people. And you can see here this quote, which I'll read. We're a Zionist organization that sees in human rights a moral obligation to everyone who sees themselves sovereign in the land. What this translates to for them is they say, we absolutely believe in liberal principles and human rights, and we want to respect Palestinian dignity, we want to help Arab citizens of Israel. But at the end of the day, human rights is more limited because of this conflict and because of our prior claim to this territory. And so we want to depoliticize human rights by ending the claim to self-determination for Palestinians. And that means extending sovereignty. Where does this leave us? Well, the first thing we can say is I've proved Kassan wrong, right? Three Jews, three different opinions about what religion and human rights should look like and do look like. Three different opinions actually on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict if you, if you look into it more closely. And it suggests that our text is susceptible to multiple readings, even ones in polar opposition to each other. Uh, this is very unsatisfying, right? And I promised you hope uh, and visions of justice, and we need those right now. Um, that's very hard if you come and you say, okay, well, actually, the tradition is fragmented and it's been constructed and things and so on and that nature. But I do think the very lack of stability means that the text and the tradition do remain open to our interpretation as well. So I want to close with one more reading as promised. And this is what I would have said to the rabbi. Uh, you're a guest in somebody's congregation. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to argue Torah with the rabbi. Um, and I did not stick around for his sermon to see what he actually said. Um, but this is the way I think we can begin to look to a religious tradition as a source of inspiration for human rights without reducing it to simply it proves X or it only means Y. Uh, and I want to do this by looking to, again, the place that Kassan jumped over, which is the ancient rabbinical tradition and the rabbis of the Talmud, because they themselves talk about this verse in question uh, and what to do with it. In Tractate Sanhedrin, the rabbis observed that the biblical verse repeats the word justice, right? Now, I thought a lot about this in anticipation of this lecture, because it does if you are in uh, Hebrew, and it does if you're in most of the English translations, but of course not in a Francophone world. Uh, in most of the, in the translations into French, it does not appear. Maybe I just can't resist going back. Uh, you can see here, vous vous efforcerez, okay. Um, but it is uh, not justice and only justice or tzedek tzedek, right, this repetition. One of the core principles of rabbinic Judaism and rabbinic uh, interpretation of scripture is that no words are wasted, right? No words are repeated. It's just, um, it's a, ancient Hebrew is actually a very succinct language. And also, this is a divine document, so it can't have, you know, oh, they copied an extra word. It has to be divine, therefore, it has to have an intention behind every aspect of it. Uh, and so, a double occurrence must mean something. Why is it then written, justice, justice? Whoops. And they answer, it's been taught, justice, justice shall you pursue. Why are there two mentions of justice? The first mention refers to a decision based on strict law. The second refers to compromise. How so? It's like when two boats are sailing on a river and they meet. If both attempt to pass simultaneously, both will sink. Whereas if one makes way for the other, both can pass without mishap. 
There are, in effect, two kinds of justice here. Uh, sometimes people go on to elaborate on this passage to say the justice of mercy and the justice of judgment. Or you might say this is the justice of law and the justice of politics. The former demands legal exactitude. One party must prevail by absolute moral clarity and right. The other emphasizes pragmatic reconciliation. A path to coexistence must be found or both boats go down. The point of this reading, I believe, is that the rabbis suggest we do need both. Perhaps instead of law and politics, we should say the justice of rights and the justice of humanity. Judaism offers up both for our consideration and asks us to hold them together for the sake of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so, uh, our respondent uh, tonight is Professor Eric Kaplan, who is uh, Associate Professor of Contemporary Judaism and Jewish Education at McGill University and also chair of the Department of Jewish Studies. Uh, Professor Kaplan is currently assembling an anthology of Jewish social activist thought in North America um, uh, that spans uh, about 150 years from 1860 onwards and um, also preparing the publication of the final volume of excerpts from the diaries of uh, Mordecai Kaplan. Um, Eric's book, uh, From Ideology to Liturgy, Reconstructionist Worship and American Liberal Judaism was reissued in 2022 in the extensive new preface. Eric is uh, founder and vice president of uh, the Mordecai Kaplan Center uh, for Jewish Peoplehood. The center uses conferences, online uh, seminars, and an ever-expanding website to stimulate conversation about Jewish issues uh, that are of core concern uh, to Kaplan and the wider public sphere. Eric, we welcome you to uh, this event. I'm gonna go here because I think it just will be easier and I'll be more visible which will be a treat for you, I'm sure. Um, so, uh, Jim is a, a tough act to follow. Um, and I, I've had the pleasure of having his talk on my computer for a couple days already. Uh, so I, just to start off, I, I really am very, very grateful to be invited to speak. And, um, and really, especially, Honored, really, to uh, be able to respond to your talk because uh, I, I think you're a powerhouse thinker and scholar. So it's uh, it's a, it's a wonderful position to be in. Whether I <laughs> whether I'll pull it off will be uh, up to you to decide. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to say is that I remember Seymour. I remember Seymour very fondly. And um, Although Seymour was doing his master's or with uh, my colleague Gershon, Gershon Hundert, uh, he took at least one course with me where he audited it. And uh, I had a really good group of students that year and they were really, you know, very deeply interacting with the material and he would chime in as well. And then when they would leave, he would, he would come to my desk to talk a little bit more about it and marvel at the engagement of the students and apologize for coming late because he was searching for a parking space. Um, and it was just a pleasure. It was just a, a pleasure to, to have him in that class and to, and to talk with him. He was a real mensch, a real mensch. Um, and very fitting for this type of topic that we're looking at, that we're looking at uh, today. So as I was reading this paper, I had like two thoughts. The first thought was, well, there is a tradition that, um, that predates, you know, the, what Cassin says, that does exactly what he's unwilling to do or can't seem to find a way to do. And that would take us to, um, Two people of 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 uh, two people of note, most specifically Martin Buber and Achada Am. Right? How did they accomplish what Cassin 
doesn't accomplish because they do make the connection between the Jewish sense of human rights and politics. And the way they make the connection is the following. They make the connection by saying that for Judaism to realize and to put out into public space its conception of what society should be, it needs to have its own sovereign territory. Now, for Achada'am, the nature of that territory is kind of a murky thing, which is not fully defined. Martin Buber uh, lived longer than him and you know, lived all the way till 1965, if I remember correctly. Um, so he had the opportunity when he's writing, a lot of his core writings on this subject are in the 40s. He's responding to events as they happen. But the core, the core aim ultimately of Zionism is not just to protect Jews physically, but to create a society that is a home for what he called Hebrew humanism, right? Where every aspect of what this country does, it is an expression of that Hebrew humanism and therefore modeling it outside to the world that could learn from that. This idea is also really well developed in the thought of Yitz Greenberg, who I think is one of the, one of my, one of the deepest thinkers on this question of how you take the Jewish commitment to human dignity and you operationalize it into a kind of clear statement of what that looks like in practice. Um, but that's not what I'm going to spend the next <laughs> couple of minutes talking about because I felt like I could say that very quickly and it would be almost like a talk on its own. Um, I, I kind of wanted to respond a little bit more closely to um, you know, something that is permeate, permeates all over uh, what we just saw, which is kind of a big methodological question in a certain sense, which is, I've defined it, but it, you know, it's an obvious definition, the role that Jewish text law, culture, and history can constructively and realistically play in establishing human rights and the pursuit of social justice in general as a Jewish concern and as a Jewish imperative. Right, so again, you know, as you saw in Jim's talk, the scholars that were gathered here in 1974, and these are quotes from the written text, disputed any connection between modern human rights and the Jewish religion and in, it, it was clear that, as Jim said, their activism was born out of minority experience and Jewish politics rather than a fidelity to rabbinic law or scriptural dogma. And yet, as Jim, do, Jim notes, that ritual, religionization of human rights has provided contemporary Jews with a compelling symbolic language of spiritual moral commitment. And this is undoubtedly true. But what I'd like to do here is suggest additional benefits that can be had from this religionization, so taking Jim's point and running with it a little bit further. Um, really, one of my favorite books, the one that had the biggest impact on this aspect of my scholarly life, is Michael Staub's book, Torn at the Roots. And what, uh, what, uh, what Staub does is in the book, he gives this really rich survey of the ideological conflicts within the American Jewish community during the 30 years after the end of World War II. How he talks about civil rights movement and the, and the conflicts in the Jewish community about that, the Vietnam War and the Jewish and the conflicts about that, the emerging feminist movement and the conflicts about that and the first kind of leftist Zionist movements like Breira, et cetera, and the, all the, all the hullabaloo that that triggered within the Jewish community. Um, and he notes in the book that both liberal and conservative Jews did a couple of interesting things. Firstly, they frequently referenced the Holocaust to justify their point of view. And the other thing that they do is, whether they're leftist, liberals, conservative, right-wing militants, etc., they all invoke Jewish text, 
They forward theological arguments, and they adapt Jewish ritual to make political statements, right? So, uh, you know, as Staub points out, like the individuals who spoke here at McGill in 74, politically engaged Jews of the 60s and 70s did not learn their political positions from Judaism or any tradition. So why then, Staub asks, did they repeatedly access these cultural materials? Now, the, he gives two answers that I'll, that I'll share with you. The first one kind of echoes a bit uh, what Pro Professor Leffler told us, but it expands on it in a very simple way, but might be a, a useful way. So the first point then is um, Judaism, though not the impetus of this activism, played a key role in justifying and sustaining its political commitments by placing these in a rich narrative that transcended this particular moment, but also spoke directly to it, right? So it gave it a timeliness and a timelessness. But what I like here as an addition is this concept of not just, just justifying, but sustaining. Because I think that issue of sustaining is a major challenge in any social activist work. <laughs> You're always on an uphill battle. And that element of sustaining, and we'll get to back to it again in, in another aspect, I think is an essential thing. But perhaps the thing which is really something new on the table that he talks about is liberal activists in the 60s and 70s, he points out, faced fierce opposition within certain sectors of the Jewish communal establishment and found the Jewishness of their public policy positions questioned and branded as undermining the Jewish present and future. Does that ring a bell for anyone here? Uh, it rings a bell for me, for sure. And um, the way they responded to this critique was by being even more emphatic in their assertions of personal Jewish identity and concern for the Jewish people. And they dug deeper into the Jewish tradition to find verses, rituals, and historic moments that could support their political views. So in other words, by accessing the tradition, progressives fought back against attempts by the Jewish establishment to marginalize them. Um, and that's also something I think you can see happening a little bit in the Jewish world today through people like uh, Art Waskow, um, and I, I think even more vividly because of how much he's out there, Peter Beinhardt, um, who's a really powerful voice in this sense. And then Stott points out there's an additional benefit here, which is all of this mining the Jewish tradition for you know, materials that are of relevance to contemporary political debates uh, led to uh, religious renewal, right? And you can see this in the stories of some of the people. So Art Waskow, you, you know, was a very important activist in Capitol Hill in the 1960s. He, was in a, he worked at a think tank. He had been an advisor to a, uh, to a congressman, but it was, um, discovering that the Jewish tradition could be a well for giving an additional level of depth to his activism that brought him into the Jewish fold in a much more serious way, which is where he's, he's now 90 years old, where he's uh, you know, lived out pretty much most of his professional life. The last thing that I'll just say, and with this I'll end, is how about the the other question, which is, can religious tradition really enrich our understanding of the core ethical and political challenges that we face, right? Um, again, as we heard, a verse like Deuteronomy 1620, you know, justice, justice shall you preserve, pursue and the connection afterwards to the land, can be used to justify very different political stances and accordingly, on its own, it's not very convincing, I think. Uh, although it could be inspirational, but it's not convincing in, in terms of living practically, right? Even using the verse to make a more concrete, practical statement, 
is not sufficient because again, if we go to the example that, uh, that Jim showed us at the end, if you take a look at the assertion, where two boats sailing on a river meet, if both, both attempt to pass simultaneously, both will sink, whereas if one makes way for the other, both can pass without mis mishap, is a very broad principle still. Right, it's more concrete than just this justice shall you pursue, but it's still a very, very broad principle. It does not provide us with specific Jewishly rooted guidance to navigate, for example, the terrible moral and operational challenges that Israel faces in responding to the Hamas massacre of Israelis on October 7th. And so with this in mind, I thought of Rabbi Jill Jacobs, who's a, a leading light in Jewish social activism, both because she's a, you know, she's a wonderful activist, she's a rabbi, but also because she has a master's from the Jewish Theological Seminary in Talmud. So therefore she has a level of textual uh, control that very few Jewish activists today have. And she wrote in Shofar a really good article where she analyzes the various different ways in which Jewish social justice world tends to use verses and, and materials. And she finds it lacking for the reason that I just mentioned. And she urges us to take our texts and our history more seriously. Specifically, this is what she suggests, and it, what I'm gonna read now includes some quotes from her. We need to enter a dialogue between Jewish texts and contemporary issues in which we bring each to bear on our understanding of the other. What does this involve? This involves a deep dive into rabbinic sources one that underlines their complex and diverse arguments. In other words, Jewish social justice uh, work often takes one, <laughs> one perspective and will quote it. It very rarely shows a variety of perspectives on an issue. She suggests that we have to you know, take a deep dive, show all the multiplicity of voices, look at those complex and diverse arguments, but at the same time, put those in dialogue with an equally serious consideration of current lived experience and insights gained through the humanities and social sciences. And if you look at her books, they exemplify what she's talk talking about, how she goes about doing so. And she tells us that in so doing, we will undoubtedly reconsider our assumptions about the tradition and about societal issues. Why? Because classical sources surprise and they challenge. And if we're not dogmatic, um, they sometimes prove us wrong. In closing, as Dan knows, I couldn't get by without saying something about Mordechai Kaplan. So, uh, writing in the aftermath of World War II, Mordechai Kaplan lamented the failure of the world's religions to prevent the war and suggested that their delegitimization de de of each other contributed to the rise of imperialist and chauvinist nationalisms. This was the, one of the big reasons why he was against the idea of Jewish chosenness. He felt that it, 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 it added chauvinism to the world and made it impossible for Jews to ask others to take chauvinism away from their lives and traditions. Um, so Kaplan said, to prove their worth anew and not be reduced to a state of obsolescence, those are words, his words, they needed now to, quote, demonstrate their power. This means religions needed to demonstrate their power to lessen the tensions between nations, races, cultures, and classes. How Kaplan is writing, it always amazes me, this is from the future of the American Jew, it was published in 1948, but it's written during World War II, which is just amazing to me in its kind of liberal internationalist perspective at a time where Jews are being slaughtered. It's not because he's not sensitive to that. The Reconstructionist magazine is one of the few places where there was a continuous flow of calls for uh, America and the other world to intervene in the ongoing slaughter of Jews. So it's not that he is insensitive to it, but for him that religion has a strong way in which it can bring up that better world and it has to act 
upon that. And how does it do it? And this, I think, is a good ending. It's a couple of ways in Kaplan's view, some of which we've seen already. One, by putting forth an inspiring vision of that better world. Two, by reminding us of the inherent dignity of human beings and the rights and responsibilities that flow from that. Three, and this goes to Jill Jacobs' point, enriching our deliberations of public policy with insights from ancestors who grappled with issues oftentimes parallel to our own. And finally, by placing us in communities that both provide allies for our work and the strength to persevere in it. Thank you. Uh, I think Professor Kaplan may have just given us an example of what you were, <laughs> the, the final, the sort of the final, that, that alternative approach. And so I'll, I'll open up, you give the floor back to you. Where should I, what's maybe what, what's, the yeah, what's, should, we, should we sit here so sure. people have something to look at? <laughs> Thank you, Professor Kaplan. Um, yeah, I think that's a, uh, I mean, uh, it's a wonderful commentary and, 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 and super commentary about it, both the methodological questions and, and the value of it. So a couple minor things come to mind, because mostly I just agree with you. <laughs> um, yeah, it's interesting about Martin Buber, um, and I think Martin Buber, in the, in the book I wrote about Jews and Human Rights, I was fascinated to learn that he was one of the founders of the Israeli chapter of Amnesty International. And um, it was uh, a simple proposition, and they were very proud. They were one of the first chapters in the Middle East of Amnesty International. Um, in decades since, the relationship between Amnesty and, and Israel has become acrimonious, to say the least. Um, and uh, it's, it's hard to imagine, you know, um, even some of the more prominent liberal Zionist uh, figures in Israel kind of um, having that same sense of possibility about a direct participation in certain parts of the, of the global human rights sphere. Um, but that just means that times, you know, things have changed and maybe we need his example all the more so. Um, and the other stuff, I love what you said about the sustenance and legitimacy as kind of key values. I, I think it's there, and I think the people that I'm writing about in Montreal, Cassin's really, he is looking for sustenance, right? I'm not sure he would say he's given up on law, even though he says the religions will, you know, they're, they're, they're our last hope. Um, but he's really looking for it, and it is striking that he's looking, but as I said, he's not willing to do what you said Rabbi Jacobs tells us to do, which is slow down. Right, and go to the text. If you're looking for it, you'll find something there, which is you know, um, what we try and do in universities also, right? Take the time to really linger with it and, and study it. Um, and I think that's one of the things that comes out of that um, moment uh, in a positive sense is these people saying, okay, let's look more closely. Let's, let's look and we'll find something there. So the question I have, I guess, is, and, and it's not a question, it's more of an observation, is, um, we both framed it in terms of sort of what does it mean for Jews who stand inside a community and face ethical challenges and face political questions to relate to their own tradition and past. Um, the harder question, I mean, and in that I agree, finding sustenance and legitimacy are important things. The harder question is sort of what we need to do when we come into a context like this and the promise is interreligious. And the promise is somehow we can begin a conversation which we can marshal our own traditions. And there, um, you know, uh, it's interesting to see in recent years different impulses. Um, I have a colleague um, who spent a lot of time doing interreligious reasoning and really getting people from different communities to read one another's texts. Um, but it was always a way in which the people who've come into the conversation have already said they want to and they're interested in it. Uh, I have another colleague who I saw when I was in Jerusalem last year who said, and he's a, he's a, a, a rabbi who said, the only value in dialogue is between the people who refuse to dialogue. And so his goal was just to get the most hardline Hamas uh, imams, this is before recent events, and the most hardline rabbis and get them to talk, which 
didn't, you know, didn't really happen. But he said, it's only those people, because of their position vis-a-vis -vis authority and legitimacy and tradition, that are the ones we need to talk to. Otherwise, people have already put on the table their membership in a conversation. And I don't know, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I, I struggle with that question, too. Um, you know, the more we look into our texts, the more we can get out of them. What do we do when we want to go back out and have a conversation across textual and religious boundaries? You don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't, yeah. uh, okay, well, uh, <laughs> well, I'll tell you if just things have popped in, into my mind and they're probably not, you know, as reasoned as they, as they could be. Um, I only had one opportunity to interact with Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. He, he was here in Montreal about four or five years ago. Um, uh, um, when he was touring around his book on fundamentalism and uh, pushing back on fundamentalism. And I asked him, I got to be in this room of like 30 people around a table with, with him, which was a real treat, as you can imagine. And I asked him about something, part of what you mentioned, which is like, he, he was talking about getting kind of liberal Jews together with liberal Protestants and liberal Catholics and liberal Muslims and, and talking. And I said, well, and I, and I asked him, I told him, well, you know, that's kind of like a conversation about people like, where there's no, not so much inherent or not the greatest inherent tension. So that's like a, a relatively simple task, not simple, but simpler. And his response to me, based on his life experience, is, was that um, the ultimate hope is the more religious moderates speak to each other, the mo more they bolster each other, and the more their ideas can proliferate and then become more dominant in the public sphere. That there's really no way of taking on you know, in a real conversation, the more extreme versions. I wouldn't want to take on Itamar Ben-Gvir, you know, in the current Israeli government, because I think it wouldn't take more than four sentences before we would discover that I have nothing, They're like we're just speaking a completely different language. So that's part of it. The other thing that popped into my mind was this article that um, David Saperstein uh, published in one of the one of the political science journals in the 1980s. I, I don't remember the exact like uh, uh, exactly where and the exact date, but it was all about how do religious groups lobby on Capitol Hill. And he was talking about, you know, the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism, which he runs, but the other groups. Um, and he said is that we don't, he's thinking in the 80s, things have changed, I guess, with the position of, of, uh, of evangelicals in, in, in Republicanism, Republican movement. He's talking in the 1980s, he says, we translate our commitments to a vocabulary that plays better in, um, in public space. And he gave some examples of how that works. The bad news is I haven't looked at this for a while and I can't remember what they were, uh, but they were good enough that, is that, I, is that I mentioned it in the introduction to my anthology, but I can't remember them off the top of my head. But anyways, my hunch is, is that that is the way in practice that you carry. The other thing is I think there is power in bringing your language not necessarily with, you know, in, in, in extreme Talmudic de detail, but bringing certain parts of your language to public space um, and having it as part of the discourse. Because look at all the other language which is out there in public space. There's so much other language out in public space. Why can't there be, you know, a good liberal Jewish dialogue language, you know, as part of that communal conversation, you know, within society when there's a clear realization that there's, you know, ironclad divisions between, between religion and state. So those are, those are two things that popped into my mind. 
But by the way, as this conversation continues, if you have a question or a comment, uh, please just go to the mic there, and uh, so that uh, it can also be be uh, recorded as, as the conversation evolves. So the mic is open. You just mention your name. Hi. Maybe I'll uh, come back to the uh, Gemara, which. Uh, Professor Leffler ended with, and uh, Eric referred to uh, as well. Uh, uh, two points. I think the second is more important. First of all, uh, Eric quoted Rabbi Jill Jacobs about looking at statements, rabbinic statements, from a variety of perspectives. In that sense, it would be worthwhile going through the entire sugya there in uh, Sanhedrin and seeing all the different explanations of tzedek, tzedek, tirdov. Of, 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 what, of the, what the significance of the duplication is and how the different explanations differ, but obviously that's a different topic. I think, you, you know, you both referred to the two boats in the river. That's, that's very problematic because, so then it says, so one boat should withdraw in favor of the other, and then the Gemara asks, so which boat is it? And it says the one which is not loaded in front of, in, in favor of the one which is loaded. So when you have boats with cargo, so we know one's loaded, one's not. When we have political groups, it's a little harder. So in 1952, the Prime Minister of Israel, David Ben-Gurion, the most powerful person in Israel, the leader of the secularists, met with the Chazonish, uh, the leader of the ultra-Orthodox, the most prominent rabbinic scholar, of his day and raised the question, how are the secularists going to, and religious going to get along in the state of Israel? And the Chazon Ish answered, well, we have a narrow river. We religious have the great load of Torah and mitzvot of, of all the commandments. And you secularists, your, your ship is empty. Your ship is empty. The Chaz, uh, Ben Gurion obviously was not exactly happy. With this, he says, what do you mean our ship is empty? Uh, what about working the land? What about building a state? What about social justice? So when you get to um, concrete politics, I mean, questions and clashes between groups, who, which group has the greater need? Obviously, different groups will see it uh, differently. Um, I, I, mean, I tend to see it differently in, in the sense that the point, you know, I, I would say that however you resolve political conflicts uh, and whatever type of concessions one group may have to, uh, to the other, and however this is fought out, I would say you can't violate human rights. It's almost like I, I see that the human rights as sort of counterbalancing, uh, as being a sort of a bottom line in terms of working out. Uh, political conflict, in which case human rights might work more on, on a terms of an individual level. But those are just some ideas which I have in, in mind. Thank, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree with you. We always have to go back to the text, not just pull out part of the sugya. Um, and when you do, yeah, it raises a lot of questions also in terms of, um, you know, who in the text is, is raising these issues and why? Right. What and and of course, who are the rabbis? As they're as we, if we take them as they're presented in the text, why are they asking in this moment? Because they also represent um, a particular group and position in society. Um, but the larger issue, yeah, I mean, the two two boats. The question for me is more of those two boats are competing values, not between human rights and something else, but maybe between different rights, such as we heard a wonderful talk this morning about academic freedom versus duty of care, right? And these are both goods, and these are both commitments of universities. So then what do you do? Um, how do you balance them? And I guess the answer is you've got to make the river bigger. But I don't know. But thank you for your observations. Good evening. Thank you so much for this uh, presentation. This talk tonight was so substantial. And um, I am Serge Haddad. I'm a research fellow at the Charles Malik Institute in New York, and I'm also a lawyer. So Charles Malik was also a um, co-drafter of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And 
My question to you would be, um, now that we mentioned today John Humphrey and René Cassin and Mrs. Roosevelt, um, we know very much that they fought for the, uh, the man, the, the, the human person at the center of uh, the protection, the safeguarding of, of human rights. So my question would be, according to you, and if we were to go back to the traditional uh, authors, what, what did they have in mind in terms of end result? So we're talking about a state safeguarding the rights, but within that life, let's, let's use the metaphor called uh, New Jerusalem, what do they have in mind in terms of perfect coexistence, like further than having tea, further than just respecting each other? What, what is the end result of all of this end of war? Can we be reminded of that tonight? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Yes, Charles or Shalom Malik it was a really interesting, really important figure who many of these people worked closely with. Um, it's a powerful story of his, his cooperation because he and Cassin worked together for decades. They argued together for decades about uh, Israel-Palestine. They had, you know, um, they had very, very strong, different political views of it. Um, but they also worked very closely together on human rights. And I think that um, there are different visions of what the out, the, you know, what what is the future? What what is, where are we working towards? I think uh, Malik's Malik's vision was one of truly a united humanity, and I think that grew out deeply out of his own Christian faith, that he could understand Christendom as a model for one, uni one humanity undivided, right? And he often referred to the lines from St. Paul of neither Jew nor Greek, male nor feeble, right? This idea that what human rights should be is, is universal, but ultimately we should be able to imagine ourselves as not having any divisions. And that's a powerful vision. I think for some of the people I've talked about here, they didn't think that way because when they looked back to the, to the Bible, they saw kind of the vision of Isaiah, which is a vision of a unity of a new Jerusalem, but it's one in which there remain different peoples and even different faiths. And they all come together, but they all, all worship in their own tongues. And you haven't, you haven't lost this sense of diversity and pluralism uh, through unity. It's a, sort of, um, you know, there are different ways. To, maybe this is multicultural universalism or something else. Um, but I think that was more of a Jewish vision that developed because it arose from a sense that um, transmitted from the biblical tradition onwards that the Jews represented a powerful religious vision, but a small population and that the world was composed of huge hulking states and that they didn't imagine themselves as actually making everyone a member of their religion. And there was a kind of modesty to that, but also kind of an acknowledgement of reality. And yet there was a notion of universal brotherhood. So I think um, I've sometimes referred to this as a distinction between majoritarian and minoritarian divisions of human rights, which, which one is, what if we imagine all of us being the same and which is a powerful, compelling idea, versus one of them imagine all of us being vulnerable and minorities. And we need both of those, actually, right? Because they represent different parts of our experience in different societies that we inhabit. We live in this place, and most people are like us. They look like us. In other contexts, we feel uniquely vulnerable. And I think that those, you know, those, and there were probably, I, one could speak of other visions, but I think Malik's vision was in dialogue with those other ones about how this would, how this could develop and what we're looking forward to. Hi, um, I'm Anna. I'm one of the PhD students here. Um, thank you so much, both of you, for your, um, presentations. I'm really curious about something you mentioned during your presentation, Professor Leffler. Um, you mentioned that self-determination might be the foundation for other or all other human rights or a, foundation, a foundational piece of the puzzle. And I'm curious if you could expand a little bit more on that because to me, self-determination well, historically, and I'm not a historian, so um, I'd really love to hear what you have to say about this. Um, to me, self-determination is more of a group right. Yeah. Um, it's the individual, in, it's premised on the individual's relationship with others. Whereas a lot of other human rights are, at least in theory, inalienable, but also individual. Um, and they don't really work as well in group. 
Um, so I was wondering if you could comment on how that works, but also how um, Kassam might have thought about how that works and some of the other people you mentioned. Yeah. Thank you for your question. So there was a profound debate then, um, and there remains one about how to understand human rights in terms of individual rights versus group rights and um, whether one should take precedence over the other, we should start with individual rights, or whether the two actually are interdependent in some fundamental ways. So we can give different accounts of human rights appearing as a modern language of dignity and a modern language of universal morality. Um, but historically, you have a phenomenon that comes about where uh, you know, the rights of man, the rights of man are in contrast not to the, you know, rightlessness of man, but to divine right and the rights of kings. So what Cassin is so, uh, um, what he's so um, inspired by is a French story in particular, which is a story of democracy appearing when people say, no, the king is not some divine origin person. In fact, we have rights as the people, we have rights that are human rights. Now then the question becomes how you make those rights real. And then in the case of France, they'll say, we'll make them real by creating a French nation. Um, that's, only, that's one genealogy, right? And there are others we could talk about that emerge out of religion, particularly out of um, natural law, right? Catholic and Protestant thought in different ways. But when you jump to the 20th century and you jump to the moment in which the Universal Declaration is being created, if you look inside it, it includes both individual and group rights, because it includes things we think of as only applies to an individual. Um, the freedom of expression, uh, you know, the, uh, political participation, things like that. And then it includes other things which apply to groups uh, involving language, involving minority identity. And I think since that time in 48, what happened is people continued to debate about how to, to use Professor Kaplan's word, how to operationalize those rights. And therefore, the question emerged, well, which is more important? This moment I've described to you was a moment of crisis because, not just because of Jews, not just because of Judaism, the Middle East. It was also a crisis because a generation of people who had said, coming out of World War II, we all know that individual dignity should be the starting point. And therefore, these basic core freedoms, which we associate with Western democracy and liberalism, that should be the main thing, isn't it? And another thing is that's secondary. But they were engaging with a part of parts of the world and people from the global south who are saying, "Wait a second, you know, we've experienced our cultures being destroyed." And there are there are analogies also to the the, the conversation that was that some of which was uh, mentioned earlier today about First Nations and about the, in this context right here, right? So if you talk about you have an individual right to free expression, but you've lost your language in which to use it, um, you, you have a tension there. You have a, you have a moral problem there. So the groupness of it for many people when they began to talk about human rights in the 60s and 70s was, was really about the minority experience should be something, should be a moral template for how we understand humanness. Uh, you might call this communitarian, you might call it uh, a group conception. I think that those are interdependent in lots of profound ways and that it, our job is to kind of be aware of that and come up with visions about how they relate and harmonize. But I don't think we can simply get away them, from them by, simp by you know, saying individual free expression is, is, uh, is more important than the right to a language, or the right to have your children educated in a language, or the right to have um, um, recognition of religious difference, right? And these are, these are very hard questions. But that's a very long answer to a very long-standing debate about them. And I think we sometimes forget how much that was a huge factor um, for these people. Uh, whether or not they agreed about that, how much it was really central to this issue. It's come up in the things we heard about today also, right, when we talk about phobias, and we've, we've talked about um, different forms of hate speech, really, right, and discrimination against minority groups, uh, in which they have a collective right to dignity, uh, and that contrasted with individual free expression, which is something that is also a core right. So my message usually when I when forced to address this is to say I'm not here to say we um, have to, uh, you know, um, only choose one. We have to recognize that they coexist, sometimes in a state of harmony, sometimes tension. 
And when we recognize that, it's the starting point for thinking about what we'd like to have, as I was saying to the, to the last question, what we, where we want to get to. Thank you. I, I think uh, we're at 7 o'clock, or just a little over 7, so I think we've uh, just gotten to the point of the conclusion uh, of our discussion today. And I want to thank Professors Loeffler and Professor Kaplan for just a, an extraordinarily rich uh, discussion. Um, uh, you know, we've, we've been talking about so, sort of modern human rights issues, uh, uh, and but we've kind of heard from and it's the complexities of one tribe within this conversation. In Judaism, we, uh, despite our modernity, I think we still are very tribal communities in many ways. And, and within each tribe, uh, there's sort of layers upon layers within each tribe. And, uh, and we've been hearing some of that complexity today. And I think you've uh, both given us an extraordinarily layered and deep uh, discussion of uh, evolving conversations within Judaism on human rights. So I, I just, uh, just, I'm really thankful for, for what you've offered us tonight. Um, uh, we do have a reception uh, downstairs waiting for us. So uh, we welcome you all to that reception and uh, maybe an opportunity to uh, interact with the speakers as well. So thank you. Thank you, Professor Love. Thank you. Thank you.